Good morning. So Good morning. our next speaker is a professor of clinical psychiatry at Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. He is the director of the New York State Center of Excellence for Cultural Competence and the Hispanic Treatment Program. He is also the co-director of the Anxiety Disorders Clinic at the New York State Psychiatric Institute and the lecturer on global health and social medicine at Harvard University. He focuses his research on developing clinical interventions and novel service delivery approaches to help overcome inconsistencies in the healthcare of underserved cultural groups. This, along with his studies in the way culture affects individuals experience of mental disorder and their help seeking expectations has allowed him to lead the development of the DSM-5 cultural formation interview. Please help me in welcoming the principal investigator of this project, Dr. Roberto Luis Fernandez. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm going to attempt to share my slides, hopefully. Oh. Hopefully that'll work. Um, let me do that here. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Then I will uh, try to minimize it so I can do that. Great. You should now be seeing it in uh, presentation mode. Is that correct? OK. Basically, you see my slides. Yes, yes, so, we are. Good. So <clears throat> I'm going to be speaking about individual cultural assessment, and particularly, as you said, thank you for that nice introduction, focusing on the cultural formulation interview, which I will describe throughout my talk. This is the summary of my talk. First, I'll try to define culture very briefly. I'll uh, <clears throat> speak about the need and what is a sociocultural assessment for individuals. I'll describe the cultural formulation interview which is uh, known as the CFI. There's a typo there, it should be interview. And uh, re some research findings and areas for ongoing research. So the definition of culture. Culture in uh, many people's minds translates into something like a characteristic of a person, like a national background, race and ethnicity, something like that, a characteristic of an individual that stays fairly uh, unchanging throughout life. But the view of culture, the understanding of culture that we use for an individual cultural assessment and that is more current in anthropology is of culture as a process of making meaning of, of experience and uh, a process of having a certain social practice in the world, meaning behaving in the world as a, as a reflection of our interpretation of what is going on. So it's not so much a set of static characteristics as much as this process by which people make sense of things. And there, uh, this, this uh, process of making meaning transcends the individual in the sense that the person makes meaning out of their participation in their social groups into which they belong. Nobody makes meaning or behaves in the world, the fancy word being social practice there. Nobody does this on their own. They, they may recreate meanings, reinterpret, combine, make new meanings, but they do so based on the fact that they come from certain traditions. And that is what makes it collective, if you will, as well as individual. And an important thing to realize here is that people don't just respond to one element of their background necessarily. They may respond to some more than others or in different situations to refer to you know, one set of one aspect of their traditions more than others. But in general, people are very mixed. They are creolized to use a common word in the Caribbean. I'm from Puerto Rico. We, we use the equivalent word in Spanish. Um, everybody is a combination of uh, their experience and their backgrounds. And those are, are many. So a person is participates in experiences related to their age, to their gender, sexual orientation, national origin, religion, um, even sports affiliations have certain cultures. It's occupations. The, the, their people are 
a mix of their backgrounds. And because of that, they are always um, in movement. It's always in flux. And what may be affecting their mental health experience or their seeking of care, the, the traditions or interpretations or practices change from moment to moment and they need to be engaged with in order to be identified. And so there's a danger to stereotyping, a danger of stereotyping. If somebody uh, is interpreted as if they were always a member of a certain group and that's all they were and it, it, that group has some fixed characteristics. It never is like that. It's always in movement and in combination. And in order then to understand what the influences of, on the person's experience are from their background, you need to engage the person in order to see what aspects of their experience are being reflected in the current moment. And as such, it becomes difficult to do this with simple questions because most of what the person is doing, behaving, interpreting is taken as common sense, as normal. Doesn't everybody think like this? It's just the way people are. And it's most of it is outside of awareness. It's in practice, in movement. And so you have to do it in a conversation. You have to elicit all sorts of ideas from the person and things they do, practices in order to get a better sense of the cultural influences on them. Because they may be themselves, as it says here about the fish, unaware of all the influences that affect them. They may be very aware, they may be more aware of some than others, but you can't assume that you can just ask a simple question in an assessment, you know, how is your culture affecting your mental health experience and get a valid answer. You really have to engage the person. So that makes it a little bit more complicated. Now, how we did it in DSM-5, and DSM-5 will be released uh, in the next few months as DSM-5 text revision. That's why the TR, it's a, a new version of DSM. Um, we did it through several, we, we uh, operationalized culture, what culture is for this assessment, as several uh, bullets here that are reproduced on the screen about the, essentially the things I've been describing to you. Culture is the process through which people assign meaning and behave in the world. That culture relates to aspects of the person's background experience, social context and position that may affect their perspective. Particularly important is the influence of family, friends and other community members because the nearest and dearest, the closest to the person are those who mostly participate in their enculturation to certain practices and interpretations. And it's also very important to keep in mind the cultural background of the providers and the system as a whole in which the person is seeking care because those themselves also influence the experience of the person. The, the, it's always an interaction with others and we, uh, the healthcare system, are some of the others that are interacting with the person. So what is an individual sociocultural assessment? We consider it a process of eliciting, organizing, and interpreting, finding out information and using it on the impact of culture and social context, so the person's background and their current social context, on the person's and social networks, views, practices, and resources. So it's the person and their community, views, behaviors, practices, access to resources, pertinent to clinical evaluation and treatment planning. And we always do <clears throat> some kind of sociocultural assessment as clinicians, even if it's we are unaware of it. We gauge the person in somewhere in their context, in their environment. This is what I call here ad hoc. We argue that it's better to have a systematic approach to um, this uh, sociocultural assessment so that we can reduce bias, able to do it the same with everybody in a certain sense, take you know, pay attention to these issues for every person, not just the ones we think are different in some way. So why do a sociocultural assessment <clears throat> in routine care? It's because culture affects the experience and expression of mental illness. Everything about the person's background is reflected in their interpretation and practice related to how they deal with mental health problems. And so in order to do a proper assessment diagnostically for treatment, et cetera, for their evaluation more generally, socially, we need to understand what the person is expressing and put it in our own terms in a translation process that is valid. 
this uh, this uh, graphic makes it seem like the clinicians are the one with order and the patients are the ones with disorder interpretations but you could flip it any which way it's a communication process where one person is understanding what the other person is saying. It could be the person with the need for care is interpreting what the clinician is saying. So they have the spool and they're putting it in order, or it could be the other way around. The, the clinician is interpreting what the person is saying, but it's a process of interpretation. And people <clears throat> express their experiences in their own idioms of distress, which are culturally mediated. Nobody essentially purely speaks DSMEs. Um, it's a, a refraction of these categories as they impact the person, the world, their awareness of conditions. So they could be completely unaware of these categories. We need to understand how it is that they express uh, this experience. And the difficulty is that for DSM, I know DSM may not be exactly the system you use. ICD is better in this respect. But for DSM, I just wanted to say, particularly <clears throat> is difficult to do, <clears throat> sorry, because DSM made a commitment to reliability to criteria-based systems, five from column A, two from column B, and that specificity makes it harder to translate people's experience because you have to include all of the world's experience into a few criteria, and that can be impossible. So there has to be some flexibility. ICD on purpose doesn't have that criterial based as arrangement. It's more prototypes, it, symptoms such as in the description. You know, depression is characterized by symptoms like as opposed to strict symptoms. So it's very, it's harder for DSM to take into account people's uh, uh, experience. And that's just the downside of, uh, reli of privileging reliability. Another reason why to do a sociocultural assessment is that. Most of the evaluation, at least for psychiatrists, leaves out a lot of the context. And there's a danger that in making this rigid assessment with categories, <clears throat> which can be very useful for some things, but not for others, in doing this kind of rigid assessment with categories, we may come to believe that the categories themselves are the disorder. This is what's called reification, the turning of a complex process into a thing. And this is something that has been critiqued about descriptive classification systems that they seem to leave out a lot of what's important. And as long as we remember we're doing that for a particular purpose and there's that's not everything there is about the person, it's much more complex than that, then we're not reifying, we're simply applying a, a tool. But if we come to believe, like many people end up doing because of the power of the classification system, that this is the diagnosis as opposed to just signs of the diagnosis, then we get into this problem of reification, which is illustrated by this uh, famous painting from René Magritte called very tellingly the treachery of images. Usually I ask the audience, what is this? But in the interest of time, well, does anybody, uh, well, I think you're all muted, <laughs> so it's hard for you to say, but uh, I will say that this in French says, this is not a pipe. And the question for the audience is, why is this not a pipe? And the answer is, because this is a picture of a pipe. And the same thing is true with the reification problem. The, 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 the categories we have in manuals are not the problems people have. They're a picture of the problems. And as long as we remember that, we'll be okay. But what the sociocultural assessment <clears throat> does, <clears throat> forgive me, is to remind us of what else is there in the person's life beside that diagnostic uh, categorization. Other reasons for obtaining a sociocultural assessment of individuals is that, <clears throat> sorry, we obtain person-centered information, the story behind what's happening, as well as more elements of the context. And this is extremely important, as I was mentioning in the previous slide. We also have other advantages that come from conducting an assessment, such as increasing rapport and trust, enhancing the alliance, aligning the treatment with what the person expects. If we know what the person expects, we can negotiate that alignment better. We even have evidence that the questions themselves evidence caring and may even empower patients. 
So what is the cultural formulation interview? Well, it's a operationalization of a socio-cultural assessment for individuals. It's a, a set of questions, <clears throat> an interview protocol that can providers can use to guide assessment. And we argue that it can be used with any patient receiving care by any kind of provider in any kind of care setting. Our group in New York led its development in DSM five for DSM-5 with a host of international collaborators. You see the map on the right of the settings where the field trial for the DSM was done in six countries. The left, the graphic on the left shows you the three components, <clears throat> sorry, of the CFI, the core CFI, which is the one that is asked of the care recipient, which I will describe more in detail in a minute, has 16 questions. The informant version is for collateral information from family, other companions. It's very similar to the core CFI, but it asks those questions of the, uh, of the person coming in with the, with the patient. And then there are supplementary modules that I won't describe in more detail in this talk, but they essentially take the topics of the core CFI and deepen them so you, have, you find out more about cultural identity, for example, or explanations of illness and so on. Now, the CFI is based on what we call the OCF, the Outline for Cultural Formulation, which appeared first in dsm 4 and is a narrative framework for the elements that an individual assessment should contain. Examine cultural identity, cultural explanations of illness, and so on. But what the CFI did was take this narrative framework and turn it into a protocol that is easier for clinicians to use. Now, whom, <clears throat> who should do this and with whom? We argue, as I said, and when in care. We argue, as I said, that anybody can do it in a care situation. We suggest that it would be better <clears throat> to kick off the evaluation started with gathering the patients and families views first so that they can tell their story following these questions. And that way we can understand their position better before we start with our story, so to speak, and asking specific questions we need to know. However, the DSM-5 in this case, these are the ones in blue, recommends it be used in particular in certain circumstances when there's difficulty understanding each other, when there's a, a difference of opinion, when there's problems with engagement like that. So it can be used at any point in care. And the DSM-5-TR adds additional uh, settings such as when there has been past experience of oppression or bias or whatever that has caused mistrust of services and so on. That's another, another particular instance when it would be used. This is what the CFI looks like on the page in DSM-5. It has two columns. The, ones on the, the one on the left in italics are the instructions to the interviewer of what the question is asking for. So if the, the verbatim question, you use it and it doesn't work, you know exactly how to re-ask it or if you wanna change it from the beginning. Then the column on the right are what one says to the person, and it includes instructions like at the top, an introduction, it includes specific questions, it includes probes, and so on. I just wanted to show you on the page, and then I'll go into each section. So there are four domains of the CFI. The first domain, the cultural definition of the problem, asks the clinician to find out what the person or their family and or their family understands is going on. And I'll go through the questions when I go through each individual question. But at the end of this first domain, the clinician should have found a phrase that will help them um, guide the rest of the questions in language that the person is using. So we want to, the, the rest of the domains have a bracket that says problem in capital capitalized which essentially is just a placeholder for you to substitute what the person feels is the problem. So instead of calling it uh, your depression, for example, you might say the language that the person used. Uh, instead of saying, what caused your depression? You might say, what caused you to feel so bad after your kids ran into trouble? You know, or something like that. A, a phrase that will guide the person in their own language that they've described in this first domain as to the rest of the interview. And the rest of the interview then focuses 
the second domain on cause, context, and support, what caused it, what makes it better and worse, who, what's been supportive, what's been stressful, and what is the role of cultural identity and all that. I will come to that when I go through each question. The third domain focuses on what they've done in the past to cope with the problem. And the fourth domain focuses on what they expect would happen now in terms of coping with the same problem we've been focusing on. Now for each section, the introduction makes uh, several points. One is that we want to know what's going on so we can be most helpful. We want to know the person's perspective. We'll ask questions, but there are no right and wrong answers. The person is the expert at this phase of the evaluation. We want to know from them what they have, what sense and practices they've made, what sense they've made of what's happening and what they've done about it. The first domain, these are the three questions of the first domain, focus on what is it that's going on? And we give probes to make sure we elicit from the person views that they may not think we're interested in. It might be that the person says when they first come in, oh no, doctor, you know, it's my schizophrenia. And if you feel that the person is just giving you something that's not complete, they're just sort of telling you what they think you want to hear, you might say, well, you know, people, this kind of probe, people often understand the problems in their own way, which may be similar or different from how doctors describe the problem. How would you describe your problem? Then we ask the person how they describe their situation to their social network. And by that, we mean the people who are nearest and dearest, usually their family. It's defined in the, in the, in the manual as family, friends, or others in your community. This is the first of three times in the CFI when we ask about the network's views from the person's own perspective. What is it they think other people think? And the purpose here is not just to get at what they are telling us is the issue, but what is it they tell other people who are involved in their care is the issue. So how, what do you tell your grandmother about what's going on? And that gives us another perspective, another sense of the range of the way they think about it. They might say, oh, I tell her the same thing I just told you. That's fine. But they also might say, well, it's for a different reason than the one I told you, I tell her X. The third question focuses on what is most troubling about their current situation. We want to focus on assessment on something that's troubling to them, not to somebody else. We are doing an assessment of a person. And this also is a way at getting at a famous definition of culture that medical anthropologist and psychiatrist Arthur Kleinman came up with several years ago about culture being what is most at stake in local moral worlds. So what is it that is at stake is another way of defining what culture is for that person. And so here we ask what's at stake, what's most troubling is a phrasing for that. That's a way of getting at their cultural interpretation. Now, as well as their, you know, everything else about what's most troubling, but it, it puts it in a certain context because what's most troubling reflects their underlying assumptions and priorities and so on. So that's the first domain. The second domain has three parts. The first part focuses on what caused it from their perspective and from that of their social network. And it could be any number of, of, pro of causes. You see the prompt there gives room for all sorts of ideas. Then the second part of this second domain talks about what is it about the context, the environment that's supportive and what is it that's stressful? And we, the, you know, you could probe about any of these things to get a better sense of their structural situation, their social context, the world in which they live. The third part of the second domain has to do with cultural identity. And first we define background or identity as simply and quickly as we can. It can be difficult. This question in particular is one of the hard ones that need training to elicit well by the provider. But essentially, we want to know what are the most important aspects of their background or identity? Do they make a difference to the problem, for better or worse? Remember, problem has been defined um, in the way the person is using it. So does, uh, does the fact that you are from a certain religion or social, social class or certain part of the city, does it, you know, does it uh, make a difference to the way you are experiencing X? And they might say, oh, really, it helps a lot because I have a lot of support. Or they might say, oh, no, no, it makes a difference. Yes, but in a bad way, because I, you know, all these stress. Then the third question asks for any other concerns. And that's where anything that may be more generally at play, you know, I'm an immigrant and I don't have any services. It's not exactly why I'm here, but that's important, may come up. 
The third domain has to, has to do with what they've done in the past. <clears throat> it could be something they've done on their own. It co could be help they've sought in the past and we give prompts again. We want to know what's most useful, what was not useful. We, the last thing we want is to go through an evaluation and tell them you need you know, medication and have them say, I'll never take medication again in my life. It was horrible. Well, you, you'd be better off if you knew that from the beginning. What, you know, they, what was most useful, net, not useful. Boy, I took that medicine. I hated it. I never want to see it again. If you get that from the beginning, you have a sense of where you are in terms of the person's experience. The third, uh, the, the, the second part of this, sorry, the third part of this third domain <laughs> has to do with got in the way in the past to obtaining help so that you also contextualize their experience and know how to try to overcome these barriers going forward. The fourth domain has to do with what to do now. First, we switch to the current moment and we ask what, what do you think is most useful now? Then we ask, what do you think their social network would be would think it's most useful. This is the third and last time when it's asked. And then we ask about the clinician patient relationship. Is there any concern about the care that we're about to provide? We, we preface it with a facilitating statement that sometimes there are concerns because of differences. There's a debate uh, whether this is too early in the process to ask this question. Would people feel comfortable saying, well, doctor, you know, I am concerned about you. <laughs> Would that come up? But in fact, we have empirical data now from a study we did here in New York in a very multicultural area, people from different backgrounds, where both providers and, and uh, patients, where about half of the patients were willing on first visit to actually answer this question. Yes, actually, I had a bad experience with so-and-so in the past. I want to make sure I don't repeat it now. You know, that kind of thing. In fact, people were quite willing to doctors they had never met to actually raise this question, answer this question. Even if they don't answer it now, they may be willing to answer it in future that you brought it up at the beginning, <clears throat> makes it easier for them to refer. You know, several weeks ago, you asked me that question. I didn't know you then, so I didn't answer. But now I realize I can trust you enough to tell you that I'm concerned about it. You're a woman, I'm a man, or vice versa. You know, what religion are you? Any one of these things that might come up or this system I know is not very helpful. I keep hearing about people coming in here and going into the hospital. I really don't wanna go into the hospital, that kind of thing. We have a <clears throat> training module, which is available worldwide in English and uh, through our website here, uh, you would be this bottom one here, you would be uh, able to access it for, <clears throat> for training in the CFI. Uh, we, we're very proud of the fact that we included five, four of them are pictured here, people with lived experience who very generously describe their experience answering the CFI question. We also have a book on the CFI if you're interested. Research findings on the CFI. Um, I think there was, I see that there's a, there is a slide missing. Um, this must be the wrong version of the slide of the slide set. But I will just say here that we have found that implementation wise, we found it to the CFI to be reliable, useful, um, uh, by considered to be reliable, acceptable and useful by patients and clinicians and by relatives. The, the clinicians in, in this worldwide global, I should say, international uh, field trial of over 300 patients and 76 uh, doctors, clinicians in general, and 86 uh, family members. Initially, the clinicians felt it was difficult to do this. There wasn't enough time. But with a practice, after a single practice event, that difference between feasibility, this concern it could be feasible, and whether it'd be useful. They thought it'd be useful, they just didn't think it was feasible. That, that difference went away after a single administration. And the more they did it, the more the, uh, the, uh, the numbers were equivalent in terms of feasibility, acceptability, and uh, uh, usefulness by the clinicians. The patients always thought it was feasible, acceptable, and useful, and the patients always liked it better than the doctors, which I'm happy to say. Um, another thing that was in, happening with implementation is that it needs training. 
because it isn't clear. The questions may be hard to interpret, like the culture question needs a little bit of training on what we mean by culture, like what I've described here. That's important. Also, it may not be very useful with acutely psychotic patients. Um, the research from India shows uh, in a busy clinic there, they used it as part of the field trial. It shows that, uh, that acutely psychotic patients had a harder time answering these questions as it's pretty, could be understandable. At the same time, patients in, in the mid-Atlantic region of the United States in the VA system with chronic psychosis did not have difficulty. So it may, it's not that they're psychotic, it's whether they are severely psychotic at the moment in a way that interrupts their ability to answer what they think. Um, the other issue is uh, that implementation ought to be flexible. That is to say, it shouldn't be just mandated, do it this way and only this way. People, in, when we tried, when we asked uh, providers in uh, inpatient units in New York State, they, they wanted some flexibility in applying it with different patients who are in needs of different things. Like if you are in a forensic legal system and the person has just arrived, that may not be the right moment to ask them these questions. It's better to ask them after they've been there a while and have developed some relationship or with, the fact, uh, with the clinicians. In terms of key areas of impact, there's work that shows that it helps the accuracy and completeness of a diagnostic evaluation. This is work that comes from the general cultural formulation framework that I was describing in DSM-4 where people working in the Netherlands with Moroccan patients are comparing the use of an, eva the, the, an evaluation that used a standardized uh, diagnostic questionnaire with and without cultural formulation interview type questions. So when they just had, uh, the, it, it, they might've done the assessment just without uh, cultural formulation questions or with. And the assessments were compared in between Dutch clinicians, the patients were all Moroccan, and the, the clinicians were sometimes Dutch and sometimes Moroccan. And so what agreement here means is the agreement between the Moroccan clinicians and the Dutch clinicians evaluating Moroccan patients. And what you find is that with the cultural formulation items, the agreement between Dutch and Moroccan clinicians is much higher than without the items. Also, the stability of the diagnosis with the items over time is much higher with the items than without. The, 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 the stability of the diagnosis, I should say, over time, the fact that they diagnose schizophrenia now and schizophrenia in the same person 30 months later, that agreement is much higher with the items than without with Moroccan patients comparing Dutch and Moroccan psychiatrists. And also the relative risk of first contact schizophrenia is much higher without the items. It would seem like all the Moroccans have schizophrenia or much, many more of them. Whereas in fact, if you use the items, they just have higher, slightly higher likelihood of schizophrenia, which has been found among migrants in many parts of the world. There's still a question whether this is accurate, but at least it's much closer to the native Dutch rates of schizophrenia than if you don't use these questions. Another example comes from uh, the McGill Cultural Consultation Service in Montreal, Canada, which is a consultation service that receives referrals from all over the city of Montreal from providers who feel that there's something, quote, cultural about the situation that's getting in the way of their treating, assessing, and treating their patients. So they refer these patients for consultation to this service at McGill. And of the 300 and plus uh, <clears throat> uh, patients who were <clears throat> presented in this article, 70 of them came in with a referral diagnosis of psychosis and three, 253 without. And you see here, what this says is after they use the cultural formulation approach, almost half of the patients with psychosis were re-diagnosed as non-psychotic. They were mostly uh, immigrants and refugees from sub-Saharan Africa and other places that who had PTSD, dissociative experiences, adjustment disorders that were being misdiagnosed as psychosis, according to this consultation service that did a more thorough assessment that include the cultural formulation. Whereas the other way around, the patients who came in without a diagnosis of psychosis, only 5% were re-diagnosed after the more in-depth evaluation you were seeing the cultural uh, assessment as having psychosis. <clears throat> so you see that there is a danger 
which has been documented many times, that clinicians who are unfamiliar with a person's presentation may overdiagnose psychosis where it isn't present because they don't quite understand the things the person is telling them. Other areas of impact have to do with enhancing communication rapport and understanding. These are data from the CFI field trial in our site in New York. These are the percent of the time that patients and clinicians endorsed certain uh, uses of the CFI questions. Patients in the purple, clinicians in the teal or blue-green color. The patients, for example, felt it was great for increasing rapport, for express, allowing the, the enhancing communication, allowing the expression of caring. Uh, clinicians liked it for eliciting patients' perspective, enhancing understanding of illness, and so on. So there are specific uses that vary slightly from between clinicians and patients, but in general, you see the percents down here. Many people uh, thought it was useful. Another element has to do with clarifying idioms of distress. And by idioms of distress, I mean the ways in which people normally expressed the, express their mental health problems. For example, in the Latinx or Hispanic Caribbean, you have certain cultural concepts that are very common. Some of them are here, suffering from nerves, being loco or crazy, suffering from a demon among people in certain religious traditions and so on. There's certain ways in which people interpret, this is true all over the world, not only in you know, it's true in, in the Bronx, in New York City, in Manhattan, it's true everywhere, that people express their conditions. You know, here, for example, we use burnout now a lot. It's become popular to speak of being burnt out. That's a cultural concept of distress that has a particular set of experiences and expressions and interpretations. And so, on. so these are the ways people speak. And by idioms, so that's what I mean by idioms of distress. But what's interesting about the combination, the relationship between psychiatric mental health categories and these cultural concepts is that the relationship is never one-to-one. -one. I haven't found one yet that is one-to-one. -one. What makes a category hang together in the professional environment is, is considered it to be different things, so to speak, in the folk nosology and vice versa. What makes a category hang together in the folk nosology may be considered different things or conditions from the psychiatric nosology. So it's a process of translation that needs to happen. And the sociocultural assessment can help you do that. Sorry about that. It's uh, somebody calling me probably to sell, and sell me a car warranty or something. Um, it'll go away in a second. So here's an example of clarifying idioms of distress. Um, a case of a 48, that's the last ring, 48 year old Dominican woman who came to seek care at our facility. She stopped antidepressants at week six after her major depression had improved. And she, we asked her, we used the CFI type questions to ask about it. She said, oh yes, yes, uh, my condition, antidepressants are very necessary for it to control too much liquid in the brain that causes the depression, but I am nervous since childhood and I have attacks of nerves. Therefore, relapse is inevitable. I have this long-standing condition, ongoing antidepressant is useless and harmful because it has all sorts of side effects. Therefore, I've stopped antidepressants before, my condition will return and I expect I'll need to restart it in the future once I get it again. So you see, this is useful information. It would have been better to have elicited it at the beginning. Useful information that uh, <clears throat> you could use in describing the, the need for antidepressants and what we think of them. You may not convince the person, but at least you know where the person is coming from. So you have a chance of negotiating care that is uh, you know, more shared as opposed to having the person stop coming without telling you why and thinking that you don't really understand anything of what's going on about them really. Another uh, element here is cultural competence of trainees. There's data that shows that the CFI helps improve cultural competence, uh, pre-post sort of analyses of uh, clinicians in training, cultural competence increases. And uh, CFI can help most likely, meaning we have evidence that shows that it helps treatment planning and engagement. For example, here is a case of a 39 year old, a different 39 year old Dominican woman and a different study that we are treating again for major depression with antidepressant uh, treatment. She's doing fine. She's sliding, it starts to slightly better, but one week after increasing the dose of the medication, 
she tells me that she has developed a tremor, which means that her nerves are becoming uncontrolled. When I ask her about her culture, when I do a sociocultural assessment, she describes that that means that she now is at risk of very serious side effects, something like Lou Gehrig's disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, that sense of complete collapse of her motor and nervous system generally. And uh, because she has a young family with four daughters, one of them has intellectual disability, she's a single mom. If she is selfish enough to continue this treatment process, she risks the total destruction of her family, the death of the child with intellectual disability and so on, because she will not be there. You know, she will be lost as a side effect of these medications. So we discuss this and we manage to, I say, okay, we have other medications. <laughs> I mean, if I hadn't done this assessment, I might have said something like, oh, don't worry, that tremor is nothing, it'll go away. But, or it's not so big, I can't tell anyway, you know, that you have a tremor. So it, it wouldn't have addressed her concerns and she probably would have dropped out of treatment. But instead, I took it seriously. I said, well, we have other medications, let's see what they do. And they didn't uh, give her a tremor this time around and she was able to complete first the 12 week trial and then the six month follow up, doing very well from her depression. Another uh, study that we're doing at the moment that we just published shows that in, the, in a clinic in Queens, very multicultural, again, clinic, um, we randomly assign people to either a CFI-based assessment or regular assessment. And the people in the regular CFI, in the, in the CFI assessment dropped out discontinued treatment two times less than the ones in the uh, half the time as the ones in the uh, regular treatment arm. So areas for ongoing research in the interest of time, because I'd like us to have a little bit of discussion if possible. Um, there is no, uh, th th there's lots of work to be done. We need to know how best to, you know, what, what, how best to use it. Is it better to do it all together? Is it better to intersperse it throughout the, the, uh, the assessment? We think it's good to do all together to get the person's full story, but it's an empirical question that should be tested. In implementation, how do we implement under team-based care where it isn't just one clinician doing an assessment and doing the diagnosis and doing the treatment, but a whole team? Who should do this assessment? How do they communicate it to other people? How do you handle in the team? How do you handle the power dynamics where usually the person assigned to do this is the one with least power in the team and has to discuss what they've discovered with the clinician who is the senior person making the diagnosis and, and the, or you know, leading the care who may not have done the assessment. How do you do that in a way that, uh, that is done well? How do you use electronic health records, for example, uh, to structure the information so it's more easily shared and used? And then how do you improve it over time? Uh, for example, how do we make that question on background on identity even clearer? How do we include more aspects of the person's structural context, their social determinants of mental health, and so on? So in conclusion, I hope I've shown you the value of sociocultural assessment in recontextualizing clinical evaluation and eliciting person-centered information. The DSM-5 cultural inter uh, formulation interview is a way of doing it that can be implemented in regular care um, and it shows promise in enhancing quality of care. It can be combined with any number of other therapeutic modalities because it's an assessment tool that can then be incorporated the information in later types of treatment. I showed you in the examples, for example, of psychopharmacology uh, medication treatment. It may help enhance the quality of care and overcome disparities, and it needs additional research to continue to show its uh, efficacy and all the other implementation questions. Here is my email if you have something to contribute on the CFI. And I'm going to stop there and ask for open up for any discussion that we're able to have under the current uh, arrangement of the conference. Thank you, Dr. Luis Fernandez. If there are any uh, Zoom attendees that would like to ask questions and you have access to your microphone, please turn on your microphones now and ask. Otherwise, if you could put the questions in the chat and I'll relay them to Dr. Luis Fernandez. I'd like to ask something. Uh, sure, please, go ahead. I, I know that you know a lot of the work we've done and and uh, has been with 
you know, as many cultures as possible. But here in Guyana, the, 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 you know, the Caribbean culture, how would the Caribbean culture be used in the CFI and in, in assessing someone with psychopathology? The, the advantage of the CFI, luckily, is that it is a fairly generic set of questions that are based specifically on what the person is interpreting and through the person, their background. But we don't do a collective assessment, if you will. We ask the person what they think is going on in their groups, so to speak, as well as how they make sense. So it can be applied. It's written to be applied everywhere. And as such, in Guyana, you would uh, are likely to elicit a certain kind of answer, but that doesn't mean that you necessarily will elicit those answers, meaning there is a, a general type of Af Caribbean sort of reply that you might get, but they're also very specific, not only to subgroups, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, people of Indian descent or people of African descent in Guyana or any number of other subgroups within, you know, certain religions or others. It, it, you could get different answers from different participants in different groups, but you could also get very idiosyncratic answers so that one, you know, Indian background person would have a different answer than another Indian background person. They may have a similar Indian background, but they still may see things very differently for a number of reasons. And so you would want to know that and then apply that information you get to that particular person. So if they belong to a certain group with a certain set of experiences, and that's what they make sense of, then you want to take that into account um, when you negotiate treatment, when you explain the what you think is going on, <clears throat> and so on, and when you understand their condition a little better. Thank you. Sure. Any questions from the uh, physical audience? One says, how can I deal with a person that have, has an issue but won't talk about it? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, not only for the CFI, but in general. Um, I think the idea is not to force the issue, but to sort of leave it open for the person slowly to trust or is a feeling comfortable enough to describe how they feel. And you can, you can ask very, concrete questions that still elicit a lot of information like what have you done in the past to cope with this is a kind of question that seems perhaps to the person to be not entirely you know offensive uh, dangerous maybe they can tell you the sort of things that work that didn't work that they did but through that you get a sense of what they are what their values are what their priorities are it, it can be helpful to you to understand their context better. So anything you might introduce, uh, you know, I, I hear that, uh, that this is very common as a thought. Is that something that's occurred to you? You know, you might attribute it to whatever, you know, is that, is that something that you've thought of? And in general, just asking open-ended questions and not, not uh, making the person feel bad for not answering. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Let well, me ask you guys a question. Is there, do you have a sense of this being at all feasible in your environments? Or is it, is it, do you, would you consider it at all possible to use this or is it so different or strange or, or, you know, uh, you know, not doesn't fit the, the, the world in which you live in terms of, uh, 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 you know, clinical work. Um, there was a, okay, I see that no, okay. Can you please put your email address in the chat? Uh, yes. Uh, right. I'll put it in now. Any other final questions or, or you don't have to. <laughs> it's like the, like the open-ended question. There is a, there is a question in the, in the oh, okay. uh, question and answer. How do you diagnose recurrent major depression versus uh, cyclothymic disorder, any difference in treatment approaches for a longer term? I, I, this is out of the CFI, but... Any... Yeah, it's not, it's not CFI related, but it is related to psychiatry. 
Um, major depressive disorder has, I'll answer it and then I'll answer it briefly. Major depressive disorder has more severe symptoms than cyclothymic disorder in the sense that you have to have more of depression, more symptoms of depression for, to meet major depressive disorder. Cyclothymic disorder, you would have some symptoms of depression and some symptoms of mania or hypomania, but they wouldn't be, um, they wouldn't be as, each would be not as severe. And so typically cyclothymic is considered a variant of something bipolar process. You could treat it with cyclotherapy. You could treat it with a uh, low dose, uh, you know, or a, a mood stabilizer, um, depending on how, in, how functioning, how much functioning is, uh, is worsened by the cyclothymia. Yeah, dep major depression has many more standard ways of treatment and, and more of a need for treatment that has to do with either psychological treatment or medication treatment. I'll stop there.